Hello. A while ago I did a series of videos in which I recreated Microsoft's Dangerous Creatures game, which is deeply nostalgic for me, as a PowerPoint presentation. But there was one section of the program that I didn't cover. The guided tours. Simply put, these compile various information screens from the program under a common theme. There are 12 tours in total, divided between three guide narrators. The first four are done in the style of actual nature tours, the next four cover some general topics, except the last one, which is another proper tour style one, and the last four are stories from around the world. I actually did make a PowerPoint version of these tours many years ago, so I think I might as well share that too. Now, just like my main Dangerous Creatures series, these presentations will consist of images from online instead of screens from the program itself. The tours in the program are connected by the Guides button replacing the usual Next button in the corner. I've also included an arrow button in my version so that when I share these presentations with other people, it'll give them a prompt with which to advance the slides. There's obviously no need for that in this video version, but I think I'll keep the arrow button's appearances anyway just to let you prepare for the slide transitions. Also, I apologize for the sound quality of my narration. Like I said, I recorded it years ago, and on a headset at that. Now, I've decided to split this reenactment into two videos with four tours in each. In this first part, we'll be doing the first four, the ones that simulate actual nature tours. These are hosted by a guide named Harold in the version of the game that I own, but when I was a kid, some friends of mine had the original version with American voiceover, and I'm pretty sure he was called Fergus in that one. In part two, we'll do the next four, hosted by Christine, but I think she was called Tawny in the other one. The only tours I didn't record are the last four with the storyteller, whose name was unchanged in both versions, Safara. Why did I ignore them? Because it just didn't feel right somehow to try and add images to the stories. So with all that said, let's begin with the first tour, Amazon Adventure. Welcome, gather round. Our paddlers are just about ready to take us on a bird watching trip down the river into the Amazon rainforest, where, if we're lucky, we'll see a flock of brilliant parrots on the wing. Click the arrow button when you're ready to get underway. In this tropical rainforest, there's a lot of heat and humidity. The plants grow up, down, and sideways, and they're so thick in some places that it's hard to see the wildlife. You never know what might be lurking behind a giant philodendron leaf. Oh my, look at this! This passion vine caterpillar isn't really dangerous to us, but you wouldn't want to touch those nasty looking spines. And it's full of cyanide too. It absorbs the poison from the passion vines it eats. Stand back, give it plenty of room. And look, they're on the ground! Step back quickly! That's a Brazilian wandering spider, one of the deadliest spiders in the world. There may be others about. Let's get into the canoes now and out onto the river where it's safer. Keep your hands in the boat, please. Maybe it's not so safe out here. That's not a log floating by. One of these crocodilians could snap your fingers right off. And you thought they only had alligators in Florida? Down here, they're called caimans, and they'll eat anything they can grab. But back to the birds. I think I see a scarlet macaw now. Let's just paddle a little closer to that branch overhanging the river. Oh dear, I've got to get new glasses. Actually, this bird eats scarlet macaws. Yes, plucks them right out of the air. And keep the small children out of sight, folks. Harpy eagles also carry off monkeys, and I don't know if they can tell the difference between a two-year-old and a howler monkey. They seem very similar, even to me. Oh dear, what are those yellow eyes over there? It's a jaguar! Stay calm, stay calm. It's a big cat, but it's not likely to attack. I don't think. Well, yes, right, they do swim. But we're safe right out in the middle of the river. It can't get us here. Anyway, jaguars don't attack people. Well, not tourists on vacation anyway, I'm sure. Let's focus on river life. 
For example, if you lean over close to the water, you'll notice a school of beautiful red-bellied fish. Notice the round shape and the mouthful of teeth. I say, what impressive teeth. Oh no, get your faces out of the water! Those are piranhas! They're generally placid, but they could bite your noses right off if they chose to. Oh, I knew they were piranhas, of course. I just thought that everyone should have a closer look. On the right, note the beautifully coloured leaf floating by. It has a rather large, nice pattern and appears to be attached to a... a tail? Oh, yes it is! Oh, that's an anaconda, a sort of gigantic type of boa. These snakes swim and lounge around on the banks. They could be anywhere. They eat fish and caimans and birds and small children. Oh, just kidding about the small children, folks. <laughs> but don't let it climb into the canoe, just in case. There's another type of boa over there. And, well, really, it's swallowing one of our birds. How are we supposed to bird watch when snakes are gulping them down at every opportunity? Honestly. My, this is an awfully snaky place. Up there on the branch of that tree, that's a baby emerald tree boa. Yes, 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 I know. Emerald does mean green, and yes, obviously the snake is red. But that's because it's young yet. As it gets older, its green spots will get bigger and bigger until it's not red anymore. Now there, overhead, that's an adult emerald tree boa, possibly the baby's mother. That red one I just pointed out will look just like this when it's grown. Really, it's one of nature's magic acts. Speaking of magic acts, there's one right here beneath the canoe. Oh, don't dangle your fingers in the water! This is an electric eel. It's a fish that can generate electricity. It can give you quite a jolt. No extension cords or plug-ins needed. No, it can just zap you from afar. Snakes, piranhas, electric eels. This expedition is getting quite out of hand. Let's pull over to the bank and try to spot some nice birds or tropical butterflies. Ah, at last, some of the beauties of nature. Gather round and let's admire this colourful flower here. Oh my god, it's a frog! No, 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 no touching! This is a poison arrow frog. It doesn't bite, but it can ooze venom through its skin. Let's just let it mind its own business, and we'll mind ours. And now look what's marching our way. Army ants. They do have rather awe-inspiring pincers, but just stay out of their way and you'll be quite alright. Some forest people even welcome the invasion of army ants. The people just clear out of their huts for a few days, taking their pets and groceries with them, of course, and let the ants march through. The army ants devour all the bugs they can find, and when there's no food left, they move on. Then the people come back to a nice clean hut, no more fleas, cockroaches, or bed bugs to worry about. Now what's that snuffling about in the bushes over there? Probably headhunters or cannibals, the way this tour is going. Oh, thank goodness, it's only a tapir. A sort of furry, pig-shaped animal with a handy short trunk for a nose. Yes, one of the jaguar's favourite foods. Well, now that I think of it, a jaguar may be close behind. I suggest that we scoot back to the hotel and birdwatch around the swimming pool. I'm sure we'll see parrots there. Here we are in Australia, ready to go, as the Aboriginal people would say, on walkabout. That means going off into the bush. We'll see a lot of odd creatures here. Monotremes and marsupials. Well, they're no more odd than we are, really. Except that they live only in Australia and on surrounding islands. Well, got your hats and walking sticks ready? Hopefully we won't need more than one first aid kit. Click the button below and we'll get started. What is that? Definitely not a monotreme or a marsupial. Oh, it's one of those show-off frilled lizards. They spread their neck frills, hiss and lunge at you, and they can even rise up on their two hind feet and trot after you. They're quite impressive, actually, but they think far too much of themselves. 
They're always appearing on television and those nature shows and all that. Pay this one no attention. Just walk on. Well, if it's not reptiles on the ground, it's reptiles in the trees, for heaven's sake. These are green tree pythons. Well, yes, of course, I can see that they're not green. They're obviously not even the same color. But they are green tree pythons. They're just juveniles. Take my word for it, I have a PhD in zoology. Here's an adult. A rather large specimen, I might add. Believe me, those two youngsters will turn green like this with time. Those pits around its mouth help the python to detect heat, and that makes it easier to find warm-blooded prey. Oh, not to worry, we're not its natural prey. I was thinking more of a bird or a bat. At last, we're getting to the monotremes. Just like those pythons we were looking at, the little spiny anteater you see here lays eggs. That's why we say that the echidna is a monotreme, a primitive type of mammal. It's closely related to the animals from which it evolved more than 200 million years ago. But a mother echidna doesn't guard a number of eggs like a python would. No, she lays just one egg into a special pouch on her abdomen. And after about 10 days, the baby hatches. It stays in its mother's pouch until it starts to develop prickly spines. At which point, you can't blame mum for insisting that it gets out. Here's the only other type of monotreme on Earth today. When Europeans first saw the dried skin, bill and feet of a platypus, they thought it was somebody's idea of a joke. And they didn't even know about the platypus's behaviour about how it laid an egg and nursed its young. Speaking of nursing, did you know that the milk of monotremes just oozes out onto their fur in special patches and the babies lick it off instead of suckling like other mammals? Rather messy, I'd imagine. I'm feeling a bit sticky myself in this heat. How about a visit to the beach and a quick dip? Oh, well perhaps not. That's a saltwater crocodile, and they have been known to eat people. Not often, of course, but I don't want to be one of those front-page statistics in the Australian newspapers. And if any of you were to be eaten, they'd probably stick me back at that desk job again, alphabetizing animals by their scientific names, which nobody can ever seem to agree on for more than a month at a time. Well, as they say, regression is the better part of valor. Is that right? Anyway, what I mean to say is, let's retreat. But don't turn your backs on this beast! And what is that down there on the ground? Oh no, it's a Sydney funnel web spider. These are aggressive little spiders, and their venom is quite deadly. It's a good thing we're wearing our hiking boots. Back away, slowly and quietly. Don't make it mad. The rumour is that these fellows have bad tempers. Although how you can tell what our spider is thinking, I have no idea. Finally, a marsupial. Marsupials give birth to live young. But the babies are very undeveloped, really little more than embryos. Then, these worm-like babies make their way to mum's pouch where they latch onto a nipple and start nursing. They complete their development in the pouch. Now, why people sometimes call this marsupial a koala bear, I do not know. I suppose it's because it looks like a little toy teddy bear. But it's not even related to bears. So please, just call it a koala. And these marsupials are wallabies, like kangaroos, only smaller. According to the fossil evidence we've discovered so far, marsupials first evolved during the late Cretaceous period, somewhere around 100 million years ago. They seem to have started out in South America, then roamed up to North America, down to Antarctica, and up to Australia. It wasn't so hard to move between those places then, because all the continents were in different locations to where they are now. Back then, there were saber-toothed marsupial cats, big marsupial bears, and giant marsupial sloths, as well as kangaroo-like animals and small mousy marsupials that you can still see today. And before you ask, no, I wasn't around in prehistoric times. 
Oh dear, we would get back to reptiles, wouldn't we? I suppose it's only natural. Australia has its fair share of them. Some people call this spiky creature a Moloch, but others say it's a thorny devil, and there's no denying the appropriateness of that name. The thorns not only keep other animals from biting it, but they're arranged in such a way that they gather the dew and funnel the drips of water right into the lizard's mouth. I've been trying to devise a similar system with a tin hat and drain pipes, but I'm getting tired of standing around all night collecting dew. You just can't beat Mother Nature. Here are more devils. Tasmanian devils. If you put several of these little marsupials into a confined area with a small amount of meat, you'll find out how they got that name. You've never heard such growling and yowling and hissing in your life. They'll gobble down hair, bones, intestines, almost anything they can cram in between their sharp little teeth. But they really are quite placid fellows, as long as you don't get between them and their food. I offered one a dog biscuit once. Did I ever show you this scar on my hand? Here's a marsupial you'll never see in real life. This thylacine, or Tasmanian wolf, used to live on mainland Australia and on the nearby island of Tasmania. It died out in Australia thousands of years ago. Maybe because people brought in dogs, now called dingoes, and the dingoes ran wild and took over. But on Tasmania, the thylacines hunted wallabies and other small animals, until the Europeans brought in sheep in the 1800s. Now, if you were a thylacine, would you rather chase a scrawny wallaby that could bound away at high speed, or a nice, fat, slow sheep? Right. So the thylacines decided they liked the sheep, and the ranchers decided they didn't like the thylacines, and put a bounty on their heads. So, sad but true, the thylacines were wiped out forever. Just as people have shoved some animals right out of Australia, they've also brought in new ones. Here's a pushy latecomer. This giant marine toad, as big as a dinner plate, is known in Australia as the cane toad. It was imported with the idea that it would eat grubs and save the sugarcane crop. But it had other ideas. It ate smaller toads, frogs, and a lot of the local wildlife instead. It just gulps down anything that will fit into its mouth. It makes baby toads like crazy. And if any animal tries to eat it, it puffs up and oozes out venom from glands on its head killing the poor animal that's trying to swallow it. We've created another natural disaster that's now happily hopping around Australia. It just goes to show you, it never pays to mess with Mother Nature. Well, now you've seen some of Australia's unusual monotremes and marsupials, not to mention a few impressive reptiles and one obnoxious toad. In North America, you can find almost every kind of climate and habitat you can imagine, from frozen tundra to deserts to swamps to prairies. So there's a great variety of animal life there too. Our itinerary starts in the frigid north. Got your parka on? Well, take your hand out of your mitten for a minute and click the arrow button to get started. Don't fall into that icy water. Unlike this polar bear, you could be dead in minutes. One of the reasons polar bears can stay warm here in the Arctic, whether they're loping across the ice or paddling through the water, is because the hairs in their fur are hollow, so they fill up with air and insulate the bear from the cold. That's also why polar bears sometimes turn green in zoos where the water is stagnant. Green algae grow inside those hollow hairs. Oh, this bear is getting ready to come out of the water. Let's get out of here. Oh dear, it's another bear. But at least it's occupied. Those little arctic foxes can prove pests to polar bears, often following them like little kids follow big ones. Oh, by the way, polar bears are white all year round, except for those green ones I just mentioned. But arctic foxes turn brown or grey in the summertime. 
Oh, brrr, I can't feel my toes anymore. Let's head south to milder Alaska. Oh, I certainly hope the fish keeps this big fellow occupied. Brown bears like this grizzly are the largest predators on land. They now live mostly in Alaska and northern Canada, as well as a few spots in the Rocky Mountains. But when Europeans first crossed North America, these bears also roamed throughout the Great Plains. Personally, I find it amazing to think that these fearsome beasts were the inspiration for one of the most popular toys in all the world, the teddy bear. The real bears aren't quite so cuddly. Oh dear, now look who's shown up. Wolverines have been known to make even mountain lions and grizzlies give up their kills. They'll eat almost any meat, whether it's freshly killed or it's been dead for days. They tear up carcasses and stash the pieces in a lot of different places so they'll have food later on. Sometimes they tear up cabins and tents in search of food. Now, if that wolverine wants your sandwich, hand it over. Listen to that. The music of the north. It may sound frightening, but it's nothing to worry about, really. When a pack howls, they're just saying, we're over here. Now, most other wolves interpret that as also meaning, this is my territory, stay out. But scientists have discovered that a few packs of wolves interpret the howls as an invitation to a fight. These bands of bullies zero in on the howling bunch and try to beat them up and steal their territory. So no howling, please. It would be just our luck to attract one of these rogue wolf packs. Just a short commute and here we are in the San Juan Islands of Washington State. You can take off those parkers now. We're in luck. Look at this pod of killer whales. These marine mammals, which are also called orcas by the way, use echolocation to find their prey, just like submarines use sonar to keep track of objects around them. Some of my diving friends say that orcas can project sound so forcefully that if you're in their path, you can actually feel the sound waves bounce off you. Their mouths are full of very impressive teeth. But thank goodness, orcas are not interested in echolocating humans for dinner. They're after salmon and seals. And now it's back on the plane and off to the mountains. Really, who designed this tour? No closer now, folks. This cat does not appreciate petting. Did you know that mountain lions once roamed nearly everywhere in North America? but today you'll find them only in more remote areas, like these mountains in Idaho. Occasionally, these animals have been known to board passing trains somehow and hopped off in urban parks. Cougars in town! That gives both the city folks and the big cats quite a scare. Now, where did I put my coat? Oh, never mind. The next stop is Florida, where I can thaw out my toes. Ah, warm weather at last. You might be surprised to find that there are over 200 species of crab spiders in the meadows of North America. Some blend in with their backgrounds almost perfectly. These spiders are not dangerous to people, although any spider can bite, believe me. But to bees and other insects, they're deadly. When you go flower picking, check out the blossoms carefully, or you may hand your sweetheart a bunch of crab spiders. Oh my, don't touch that fellow! You could get a painful rash from a puss moth caterpillar. They can squirt formic acid when they're upset. Some people call them tree asps, as if they were venomous snakes. Personally, I think that's going a bit overboard. But then everyone has his little phobia. Anyway, if you see one, don't pick it up. Both you and the caterpillar will be happier. Well, really, there seem to be buggy things crawling around all over this place. I suppose that's only natural. Insects outnumber humans hundreds of thousands to one, after all. Sometimes the very thought gives me nightmares. Why, if insects ever got organized and decided to fight humans, we'd be helpless. 
but fortunately that would happen only in the movies. They have only teeny tiny brains after all, and they seem to focus their aggressions only on each other. Still, stay out of the way of these battling stag beetles. They might grab you by mistake, and those pincers hurt. Now if there's one thing I can't abide, it's an overly friendly reptile like this fellow. Oh yes, they'll smile and sidle right up to you, and next thing you know they've got their teeth sunk into your leg. Never trust them, that's what I say. They get like this because some people who live along the rivers and canals in Florida think it's fun to feed alligators from their boat docks. But it's never a good idea to teach wild animals to associate food with people. Imagine finding this fellow scratching at your back door for supper. Now here's something that you might like to find in your backyard. It's a rather fearsome looking spider, but it's smaller than your fingertip, and it eats mosquitoes and other troublesome insects. Spiny orb weavers like this one live all across the southern US, from Florida to California. Oh, first it was cold and damp, now it's hot and damp. I'm starting to feel like the proverbial limp dishcloth. Let's zip over to Arizona and dry out before my athlete's foot starts acting up. Ah, warm, dry air at last. What's that? Oh, not to worry, it's just a little Gila monster. Yes, it is venomous, but a Gila monster would do almost anything rather than fight. As a matter of fact, if you got bitten by one, the response you'd most probably get from the local wildlife authorities is, Well, just what were you doing to the Gila monster? And if you say trying to catch it, you may be in for a fine as well as a medical bill because it's against the law to capture Gila monsters in many places. So remember, if you grab a Gila monster, you may end up needing both a doctor and a lawyer. That thought is certainly enough to make me stay far away from these lizards. Let's just walk on. Oh dear, here's a creature I'm all too familiar with. There are scorpions all across the southern United States, and certainly down into Mexico. Believe me, it's always more desirable to discover a scorpion by sight rather than by touch. If you want to avoid finding out what a scorpion's sting feels like, I advise you not to reach or step into dark, cool places without looking first. Speaking of dark, cool places, let's just take a quick peek into this cave over here. You never know what treasures you're going to find in the wilderness. Ah! Back! 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 My apologies if I've trampled anyone. I've never seen so many rattlesnakes all together like this. A remarkable sight and definitely worth a notation in your journals. A photograph? I really wouldn't advise it, not unless you've got a zoom lens. You'd like a shot of me in front of the snakes? Well, I'm very flattered, but so sorry, we've just run out of time. I've got to rush now. I'm due to lead some more tours. Hopefully some without so many snakes. Ready to go on safari? No promises now. When you're on safari, you just see what you see. You can't make wild animals appear at a command as if by magic. After all, we are visitors in their world. Africa does have an incredible variety of wild animals, though, so I'm sure we'll run across some exciting ones. Click the arrow button when you're ready to go. While most monkeys live in trees, baboons spend most of their time on the ground. Looking at this fellow, it's no wonder scientists believe that people and monkeys have common ancestors that lived millions of years ago. This baboon looks at least as intelligent as most of the people I work with. Now why are there snakes on all my tours? I don't believe my contract said anything about this. Well, at least this is not a threatening one. If you told this serpent to go suck an egg, it would be more than happy to accommodate. Now fortunately, this serpent has no venom, so it isn't considered dangerous. Unless, of course, you're an egg farmer. Oh no, why me? These two snakes are very dangerous indeed. 
the puff adder sucks in air to make itself look even fatter than it is. And you'd do well to heed its warning, because its next move is a deadly bite. The Gaboon Viper holds two records in the serpent world. It's the largest viper on the continent of Africa, and it has the longest fangs of any snake on Earth. What's that? Oh no, I'm sure none of us really want to see the snake's fangs. You'll just have to take my word for it. Give them a wide berth. Now here's a creature that's happy to see snakes. When a secretary bird spies a snake slithering through the grass, the bird leaps on it and does a rather impressive tap dance on the serpent with its clawed feet. Once the snake has been stomped into a suitably flattened form, the bird rips it apart with its sharp beak and gulps it down. Not a pretty picture, at least from the snake's point of view. What a monster! Any secretary bird that tries to stomp this giant rock python is going to end up with sprained feet, or worse, as the snake's dinner. Rock pythons can weigh as much as several grown men, and they're solid muscle. Don't antagonize this one, we don't want a wrestling match. No visit to the savannah would be complete without a glimpse of a cheetah, the fastest animal on land. Well, these particular cheetahs don't look too swift, do they? Well, like most cats, cheetahs spend more time lying around sleeping than they do hunting. This mum looks like she could use a long nap. Six cubs can slow down even the fastest feline. Here are two savannah cats that don't get nearly the publicity that cheetahs do. That's probably because they're smaller, so they're not so easily spotted among the tall grasses, and they do most of their hunting at night. This serval, and especially this caracal, don't look too happy that we woke them up, do they? Well, we better drive on before they're fully alert. Ah, nature's bulldozers. Did you know that elephants help to keep the savannah a wide-open prairie? Elephants strip leaves and bark from acacia trees, sometimes knocking the trees down to get at the uppermost branches. But they don't just destroy trees, they also plant new ones by distributing the seeds in their dung. Without elephants, the savannah would soon become a forest, and the animals that depended on the grasses would be in trouble. Now what spooked these warthogs? I didn't think we were that intimidating. These animals get their name from the big warts on their faces. I don't see any warts on this side, though. Aha! Look up and you'll see what the warthogs are running from. These leopards look pretty tranquil at the moment, but they have been known to leap out of trees onto animals passing below. I always say, when tramping through the African bush, keep one eye on the ground, remember those snakes, one eye straight ahead, and another trained on the limbs above. Well, that makes three eyes, doesn't it? What I mean to say is, just keep a lookout in all directions. And here's one of the reasons why. Some snakes climb trees as well as slither across the ground. This is a black mamba, one of the fastest and most dangerous snakes in Africa. Uh-oh. Is it looking in our direction? Quick, let's get out of here and head down to the river. It's normally a peaceful spot. No serpents dropping out of trees there. There are often predators here, having a drink or waiting for dinner to stroll by. These two mother lions look as though they've come down to give their cubs a good dunking, although I'm sure that's not the case. Like all cats, lions wash their fur with their tongues. Imagine having to wash your entire body with your tongue. Why, my feet would never be clean. Not to mention other parts. I'm glad we have washcloths and towels, aren't you? Hear that? That's our signal to clear out. The hippos are coming out of the water for their nightly grazing, and they're not keen on sharing their territory with people. I've seen those jaws reduce a large gourd to pulp in a single chomp. I don't even want to think about what they could do to people. What was that rumbling noise? Is that dust rising over the hill? 
Stay in the vehicle, or you'll be trampled. Wildebeests are rather single-minded creatures, and when they're migrating, they often plunge through barriers of all kinds, including through roaring rivers, over cliffs, or through a group of tourists on safari. This is only the beginning of the Great Migration, but it's the end of this tour. We've seen hundreds of grazing animals, quite a few of the big predators, and of course those ever-present snakes. <laughs>